Hello everyone. We find ourselves in the sixth and final unit of our semester. So looking further into the late period of the medieval era of the church. And today we'll be looking at various developments within monasticism. We'll be talking about the mendicant orders, the canons regular, and then we'll talk about the, uh, the, the uh, Dominicans and Franciscans and their work in the Inquisition of heretics. All right, first I want us to compare the priests and the monks. We've talked about both of these uh, orders and uh, there are similarities and there are differences between the two. So first, let's look at the similarities of priests and monks. Both take vows of chastity. All right, they, uh, of course, we've already talked about how many times those vows of chastity are overlooked or ignored, but nonetheless, they take these vows and the expectation is for chastity, for abstinence from any uh, sexual contact. There's vows of obedience. The priest vows to obey the bishop. The monk vows to obey the abbot. Now, there's also uh, the tonsure is common to both priests and monks. I don't think we've talked much about the tonsure so far. Uh, the tonsure is uh, shaving the crown uh, that demonstrates that one has taken uh, uh, clerical vows as either a priest or a monk. No one knows the exact origin of the tonsure. Uh, there's some speculation that during the Roman era, slaves uh, had the crowns of their hair shaved to demonstrate their status of slavery. And so the clergy did the same to demonstrate that they were slaves to God. Now, obviously, I have a tonsure, but it is natural. It is not voluntary, all right? Perhaps God uh, gave me this tonsure to demonstrate my service to him. That puts it in a very kind light. Uh, otherwise, I'm just plain bald, all right? Uh, now, priests and monks also had distinctive garb that separated them from uh, the rest of society. We'll talk more about that in just a bit. All right, there were benefits of clergy. There was the right not to bear arms. Now, for, uh, for us here in America, we more often think about the right to bear arms, okay? Uh, because we are thinking about the Second Amendment. But uh, in the medieval era, uh, priests and monks uh, were not required to bear arms in the military in the service of the nobility, all right? So this was actually a benefit that clergy did not have to go to war. Clergy also were tried by the church court. And we've already talked about this, that often the ecclesiastical courts were more lenient toward the clergy, whereas the royal or secular courts would have been more stringent in the case of uh, misconduct by the clergy. The clergy also were protected by the peace of God, and this was the threat of excommunication for any who robbed or killed clergy, okay? And that was another reason for the distinctive garb and the tonsure. There was no mistaking those who were clergy. And so if you robbed killed or uh, uh, accosted it in any way uh, the clergy, then you were under threat of excommunication. Here are three examples of clerical garb, the distinctive dress 
of the clergy. Uh, the priest uh, wore uh, an under robe with a surplice on top. Uh, notice again the tonsure, both the priest and the monk are tonsured. The Franciscan monk wore a robe of brown or sometimes gray tied with a simple rope and then a hooded cloak over. Uh, the Dominican dressed in a white robe with a black hooded uh, cape on top of that. Uh, Benedictine monks dressed much like the Franciscan monks, although they had a wider variety of colors and, and so forth. There were other uh, orders with other kinds of dress, but I just wanted to show you examples of clerical garb that were worn by medieval clergy. All right, now I want to contrast the priests and the monks to show you the differences between the two. Uh, priests were in the world. That is, they were not cloistered. Uh, they were out in the world ministering uh, in secular uh, situations. They were mobile, which means uh, not only did they move about in the community, but they could move from uh, one parish to another or even move up the ladder uh, to become bishop, uh, archbishop, cardinal, wow, or even pope, oh my word. But they were mobile in their status. They were ordained, all right? They, uh, they took holy orders and uh, had uh, the hands laid on them and they were set apart for the, uh, the priesthood. And their work was the cure of souls. Uh, they could administer the sacraments. Only ordained priests could administer the sacraments. Very important. Uh, this, of course, uh, gave further centralization to the church. You had to come to the church to receive the sacraments from the priest. Their financial support came from the bishop's stipend. All right, we've talked about how uh, uh, funds flow from the churches uh, up to the bishop, and then the bishop then distributes the funds accordingly. And so uh, the bishop would administer stipends to the different parishes to support the priest and the needs of the parish. And the priest uh, uh, took a vow of obedience to the bishop. Okay. Now, monks uh, are different in that they are cloistered. They uh, reside in a monastery. Now, we've talked about how uh, some monks actually left the cloister in order to minister as missionaries. But as a rule, uh, monks uh, dwelt, ministered, functioned within a cloister. They were permanent. They could not move about. Once a person uh, took uh, uh, vows of monasticism, they had to remain in the monastery where they uh, took, their, took their vows. They could not move to another monastery where, oh, the food is better over here or the work is lighter over here. No, they remained in the monastery. They were lay people. They were not ordained. Now that is interesting uh, that they did not take ordination, uh, they did not take holy orders, they simply uh, enrolled in the monastery. Now I need to uh, clarify that within the monastery they would select one or two or three uh, monks to receive holy orders as priests so that they could administer the sacraments to uh, their brothers in the monastery. We'll see that this happens to Martin Luther uh, in his monastery. He was ordained as a priest and administered the sacraments there. But normally a monk is not ordained. Now the work of the monk is prayer. That's the opus dei, the work of God. And the monks prayed eight times a day and the prayers were uh, psalms often. They were prayers of 
of uh, communion with God, praise and adoration to God, but often they were prayers of intercession. The nobility who donated the land for the monastery, or they might uh, give funds to support the monastery, or they might uh, uh, send their sons, or in the case of a, of a, of a convent, their daughters. But when they uh, placed their offspring in a monastery, they would give financial material gifts. Well, in return, they uh, uh, expected that the monks would pray for them. And these intercessory prayers were intended to relieve uh, the burden of purgatory for those who donated, those for whom they interceded. Now, their support was communal, uh, so that uh, when they entered into the monastery, they brought whatever they had. It could be little, could be much, but they shared together uh, from the donations and also from the living from the land. Again, I've talked about this before, that, uh, that with the monastery came land for agriculture and for livestock. This supported them with food, but also uh, gave them uh, crops to sell and, uh, and that then uh, supported the monastery. They obeyed a rule. We've talked about the different kinds of rules among the uh, Benedictine monks, and we'll talk about the Franciscan and Dominican rules, but they all would follow a rule. All right, so we've looked at the similarities between priests and monks. We've looked at the differences between priests and monks, and now we're going to look at some monastic hybrids. Uh, these are two monastic groups that uh, combine features from uh, both the priests and the monks. So first we're gonna talk about canons regular. Uh, these are secular clergy ordained as priests, but instead of living out in the community, they live communally. They live together and they followed a rule. That's why we call them canons regular. Uh, they're priests who follow a rule. The mendicant orders are uh, lay monastics, but instead of uh, being confined to a monastery, they travel about and they beg for a living. That's where we get the term mendicant. They were mendicant uh, monks or friars coming from the Latin word fratres meaning brothers. So they were, uh, they were mendicant brothers who traveled about preaching and begging for a living. So uh, let's talk first about the canons regular. They developed in the 11th century formally established at a Roman synod in 1059. They were inspired by the Cluniac emphasis on clerical celibacy, and they desired to maintain this communal life among clergy serving at a cathedral. All right, remember uh, the Cluniac uh, monastic revival started in uh, 909, and one of the greatest of the popes to come out of the Cluniac movement was Leo IX, who died in 1054. And so shortly after, inspired uh, by the Cluniacs and, and possibly even further by uh, Leo, uh, they began to maintain communal living at a cathedral wherever uh, they were serving. And uh, these uh, uh, canons regular established houses near cities uh, they drew support from the emerging middle class. There were two branches, the Austin Canons. They adopted the rule of Augustine, so they were less restrictive. They would eat meat, uh, no manual labor. You'll remember that Augustine, when he set up a uh, monastery in Tagast, uh, he intended to be studious, not ascetic. On the other hand, there are the Premonstratensian Canons named after Premontre, France, where they were established. They were severely ascetic 
and uh, they observed silence, all right, the vows of silence that you've heard about. They emphasized manual labor. And so here are two branches of the canons regular. Now we will spend most of our time uh, in this lecture talking about the mendicant orders, beginning with the Franciscans, founded by the very well-known Francis of Assisi. All right, the hero of the faith we know as Francis actually was born as Giovanni uh, to a wealthy cloth merchant, but he was nicknamed Francesco or Francis due to his interest in France, either because his mother was French or because he liked singing French songs, but nonetheless, uh, he is known to us as Francis. He was raised in a uh, pampered affluence by his wealthy father, but uh, as a knight, he went off to war. And while at war, he was taken captive. During his captivity, he fell seriously ill and nearly died. When he recovered and was released, he set out once more for war, but on his way, he received a vision that called him to renounce his lifestyle and follow a life of poverty. It was soon after this that Francis announced to his friends uh, that they should congratulate him. He was betrothed, and when his friends asked him, who is the lucky lady, he said, Lady Poverty. So he betrothed himself to poverty. And in his vow of poverty, he took the uh, allowance that his father gave him, and he then uh, gave it away to those who were poor. Now, his father uh, chastised him for his uh, generosity with his father's money and said, I have given you all that you possess. And he took, uh, he took Francis to the uh, bishop in town to complain about his son. And uh, his son, in humility, simply uh, renounced all of his father's wealth, including his clothing. He stripped it off and uh, stood there naked in the town square. Uh, the bishop, uh, in honor of uh, Francis's humility, took off his own bishop's robe and clothed Francis in it, and then Francis walked away. Uh, the story goes that he sold the, uh, the bishop's robe for money. Uh, he then took up uh, uh, rags to wear, and he spent that money in uh, charitable giving. Now, at first, his early ministry was uh, rebuilding churches and then tending lepers. Uh, the story goes that Francis was uh, really terrified of leprosy, but he saw a leper and felt drawn to him. And so he approached him, and not only did he give him money, but he actually embraced him. In a dream that night, he saw that, that the leper that he embraced was indeed Christ. And so he continued his ministry to the lepers as well as other outcasts. I'm reminded of the story of Martin of Tours, who shared half of his cloak with a beggar and then dreamed that that beggar was Christ. So evidently this is a theme among uh, monastics. Well, as Francis continued to uh, do his good work uh, to minister to the, uh, the poor and the needy, to beg not only for his living but even more uh, to give to others, uh, he um, uh, added to his, uh, his ministry with the words of Matthew 10, 9. Uh, 
let me read from the context of Matthew 10. Uh, Jesus says, uh, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money bags. Uh, I'm sorry, your money belts or a bag for your journey. Uh, do not even acquire two coats or sandals or a staff for the worker is worthy of his support. And so uh, he began to uh, preach uh, as well as to uh, serve the outcasts. And he developed followers who appreciated his, uh, his humility and his life of service. And when he had 12 followers, he developed a rule. And this rule is based on three scriptures that you see listed there. Matthew 19, 21, uh, Jesus said to the rich young ruler, by the way, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Luke 9, 3, Jesus said, take nothing for your journey, neither a staff nor a bag nor bread nor money, and do not even have two tunics apiece. Finally, Matthew 16, 24. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. All right, so uh, this, these scriptures form the basis of uh, the rule of St. Francis. So Francis and his 12 followers went to Rome to appeal uh, to establish a new religious order. And guess who was Pope at the time? Innocent III. Can you imagine a meeting between Innocent and Francis? Uh, Pope Innocent, the most powerful, the most wealthy, need I say it, the most arrogant of all the popes meeting with Francis, who is an exemplar of humility and poverty. Uh, and when Francis asked for approval for his new religious order, at first, Innocent denied his request. But then that night he had a dream. Uh, and in this dream, he saw Francis holding up the crumbling walls of the church. You see this in the illustration. <clears throat> and so, seeing that Francis uh, was an answer uh, to the needs of the church, he granted him the, uh, uh, the authority to uh, um, establish a new order called the Friars Minor, that is the poor brothers or the lesser brothers. The Franciscans, as a religious order, were emotional, pietistic, and ascetic. They aimed to reach the masses through enthusiastic preaching and extreme poverty. The story is told that uh, uh, one day, uh, one of the Franciscan followers uh, brought to Francis a gold coin, which he had received uh, begging from uh, some wealthy donor. And Francis, who disdained not only the money, but especially the, uh, the, the monk's value of the coin, he said, take that coin, put it between your teeth, and then bury it in this pile of dung. All right, and so, in this way, he, uh, he had the, the Franciscan monk act out uh, a disdain for uh, worldly wealth, which uh, is less than dung to someone who is a follower of Christ. Now, <clears throat> Franciscans also uh, had a love of missions. And, of course, traveling about is part of their call. Uh, and so uh, Francis himself felt a call 
to be a missionary. In 1219, during the Fifth Crusade, Francis went to Egypt uh, with the intent to seek out the Sultan Malik al-Adil and to witness to him and share the gospel with him. So uh, he went behind uh, the enemy lines. Of course, he was captured and brought before uh, the Sultan. Uh, the Sultan received him and they had, uh, they had conversation, but the Sultan's uh, Muslim uh, elders advised him not to listen. And in fact, they encouraged him to behead uh, this, uh, this Christian preacher. Uh, Francis offered to endure the test of fire. You see this illustrated here. Uh, and he was, was willing to walk through flames if by his survival the sultan would be willing to convert. Well, the sultan declined this, but uh, still uh, honored uh, Francis, uh, offered him gifts, which Francis refused. Francis said that the only gift he desired was the soul of the sultan, but the sultan provided him with safe conduct back to his army. Uh, the story is told that before Francis departed, the sultan asked him, pray for me. Well, another Franciscan missionary that is worthy of uh, mention is Raymond Lull. Uh, you see his life dates there in the, uh, uh, the 13th and 14th centuries. Uh, he started his life as an adulterous troubadour. He was a nobleman born on the island of Mallorca, just off the coast of Spain, uh, and married uh, a, uh, a relative of the king of Mallorca. But in, and he had two children, but in spite of his family life, he was, uh, he was immoral, he was a womanizer, and chased after women. There's one story that he tells on himself that he was on a horse following a maiden uh, whom he uh, you know, was enamored with, and uh, uh, before he knew it, he had actually followed her on this horse into a great cathedral where the, the bishop ran him out. Now, have you seen the movie uh, the Knight's Tale. I've mentioned it before. Uh, in The Knight's Tale, uh, Heath Ledger plays a character who follows uh, the love interest in the movie, follows her right into the church. I have a feeling that the uh, screenwriter knew about Raymond Lull. Raymond Lull uh, was quite a poet and wrote a number of love songs. And one night as he was writing a love song, uh, to a woman who had spurned his advances. He had a vision of Christ looking at him uh, uh, imploringly uh, and, and with tears coming down the Savior's face. Uh, uh, Raymond you know, ignored it, but Christ appeared two, three, even four times. Finally, Raymond realized that Christ was longing for Raymond uh, and, and, re, and, and shedding tears over Christ's unrequited love for Raymond in the same way that Raymond was, was uh, longing for uh, this, this cheap uh, conquest. And so Raymond took this uh, as, a, as a, a, a moment to convert and to renounce his worldly ways and to follow after Christ. And so he became a Franciscan tertiary. We're going to talk more about this uh, later, but in the, the Franciscans had three levels. They had the men, the women, and the tertiaries were men or women who were married and yet uh, took vows of poverty and, uh, and service. And so this is what uh, Raymond Lull did. Now, he did not return to his family. Uh, he uh, sold his possessions and arranged for their financial support, but then he went off as a missionary. He was passionate about missions to the Muslims. He learned Arabic. He read their literature. He developed an elaborate uh, apologetic system to reach Muslims. 
and he traveled three different times to North Africa and to the Middle East. Uh, he went to uh, uh, Tunisia and then also to Bougia in what is now Algeria, and it was in Algeria that he was stoned to death uh, on the shores of North Africa. Now, one other Franciscan missionary was John Montecorvino, uh, who was an Italian Franciscan missionary who went to India, uh, but then also opened the door for Christian missions uh, to China. In 1308, he was actually made the Bishop of Beijing. He attempted to convert the Emperor of China, who at the time was the great Kublai Khan. In the 1400s, China closed uh, to Christian missions due to the repression of foreign uh, uh, religions. We've seen this happen in China before. Uh, and then in the 16th century, we're going to see China reopen their doors to uh, the Jesuit missionaries. We've talked at length about the Franciscans, uh, this new mendicant order of clergy, and next we'll talk about the Dominicans, but we will do so after a short break. All right, so uh, I will see you again in the next video when we'll continue talking about uh, these monastic developments.